This video is sponsored by Morning Brew. This video is a break from the normal schedule. I will still make the video on oligarchic structures using the example of medieval Hungary, but with recent events I wanted to make a video about the historic shift in Europe that we are about to encounter. And this video is also sponsored by Morning Brew. Morning Brew is an email newsletter. It provides you with articles, podcasts, summaries and more that give you a good overview of local American and global news. Ideal for if you need a quick summary of the world's events, like in the morning. Hence the name. I personally drink cold brew coffee, but the newsletter is just as well a summary for my mornings. One of the articles that interested me in particular recently was in relation to rising fertilizer prices as a consequence of the war in Ukraine and the impact it will have on global food prices. I like how it has an emphasis on finance and tech news, something you may like too. Go check it out, the link is in the description. It is completely free and it only takes a few seconds to subscribe. So why is this war so important politically to Europe? Uro Kekkonen is the short answer. He was an important figure in European politics and basically the main architect behind the modern geopolitical structure and security architecture of Europe. If you ever want to study political science with an emphasis on Europe or get a better understanding of modern European politics, remember him and read up on him. Uro Kekkonen was the longest serving president of Finland and a diplomat of legendary skill. At the height of the Cold War in 1975, Kekkonen hosted a European peace conference in Helsinki. Kekkonen had noticed that at that particular time, every European leader had personal experiences of the Second World War. That the generation who had fought and suffered the Second World War were now ruling their respective countries. At the peace conference, Kekkonen successfully invoked the horrors of that war to argue to Europe's leaders that there was a duty for them to not let such a catastrophe befall Europe again. And his appeal worked. The result were the Helsinki Accords, a treaty by which all European countries, no matter if Western Bloc, Eastern Bloc, NATO, Warsaw Pact or neutral, agreed to respect the borders, sovereignty and territorial integrity of every other European country. These accords cemented diplomacy as the number one foreign policy priority of each and every single European country in its foreign policy entanglements and engagements with other European countries. And this is the foundation of the modern European security architecture. When European politics is discussed, you may sometimes have heard the phrase in the spirit of Helsinki, which is a reference to this. Basically, after centuries in which Europeans competed in creating spheres of influence by subjecting, oppressing and invading other Europeans, a process sometimes called the Concert of Europe and which led to two catastrophic world wars, we all decided and agreed to stop. We would no longer try to force our will on others and we would no longer attempt to create spheres of influence over our neighbours. If you wonder why you have never heard of Kekkonen despite this important accomplishment by him, that was the point. He didn't want to become famous or win a Nobel Peace Prize. Kekkonen genuinely wanted to create a political framework and diplomatic foundation for a lasting peace in Europe. And with that in mind, he decided to do 99% of the work and take none of the credit. So everyone else could take credit for this peace agreement and thereby make it more likely to last and seem organic. The Helsinki Accords made a European war between nations impossible as long as all European nations abided by its principles. And that all nations of Europe have for almost 50 years. It became a foundation of European politics and it set standards that European countries applied on themselves but also abroad. A majority of European countries apply the principles of the Helsinki Accords in their foreign policy. It is for example a reason why so many European countries oppose the American blockade of Cuba and why so many European countries refuse to join the 2003 American invasion of Iraq. The Americans, in particular the Republican Party, came to heavily dislike this agreement. Rumsfeld infamously referred to it, disparagingly, as Old Europe when France and Germany refused to join the war in Iraq. 
but it has also been a legitimate impediment to security in at least one occasion. It is the reason why the Europeans didn't intervene against Serbia to stop the Bosnian genocide until it was too late. Over the decades, this security architecture had a decisive impact on Europe. It furthered the creation of the European Union, it furthered substantial cooperation in economy, education and culture between European nations. Starting in the 1970s, it resulted in a substantial disarmament of many European militaries because we all believed that war between European countries would no longer happen. It cemented neutral countries, in particular Sweden, Finland, Austria and Ireland, as Europe's peacemakers. Makers. We also tacitly agreed that Europe would not become a superpower in pursuit of global geopolitical power, something the French and British very disliked. We also decided that Eastern Bloc countries inherited this agreement after the end of communism, and it enshrined an idea of furthering economic codependence as a mechanism of ensuring peace. Meaning, if we all open our markets to each other and become economically dependent upon each other, war would be far less likely. In short, we spent the last 50 years in Europe under a mutually agreed upon peace. A peace we continuously worked on to expand and secure. A peace that figures from Brezhnev to Kohl to Mitterrand to Gorbachev to Thatcher to Yeltsin to Walesa to Havel to Schroeder to Chirac to Erdogan to Kaczynski to Merkel to Sarkozy and Co. all agreed upon throughout four generations of European politics. And in February 2022, Putin took that agreement and tore it to shreds. If you are someone who thinks Putin had some supposedly legitimate reason to invade Ukraine, you can go ahead and formalize whatever rationalization you want. In the end, it doesn't matter. Whatever excuses for Putin that you may craft together, whatever rhetorical device you can come up with to blame NATO, the European Union, the Americans, the Ukrainians or whoever else, it is all completely irrelevant. The one and only thing that matters to everyone here in Europe is that Putin destroyed the spirit of Helsinki. Urho Kekkonen's peace is over. This is what makes this moment so grave, unprecedented and dangerous. We here in Europe are in uncharted territory. The foundational agreement we all had to ensure peace in Europe is now dead. And in the coming years, we are going to find out what we will replace them with. And since we in Europe are democracies with systems of public accountability, the onus is also on you my fellow Europeans, who make up 55% of my audience, to debate, shape and vote on what you would prefer the new security structure of Europe to look like. Now, this of course does not mean that peace between European nations is dead and large European wars are imminent. What it means is that the agreements we had to ensure peace in Europe need to be re-evaluated, renegotiated and newly defined. And those things that we may have once considered to be geopolitical certainties will be called into question and we should be wary and cautious of that. We are already seeing some consequences. Germany is rearming and I cannot overstate how significant that is. It is a clear break with an 80-year policy commitment of pacifism and demilitarization. Poland expanded its military spending massively. Within the next few years, Poland may have one of the largest and most powerful militaries in Europe. We all used to rely on the United States for our defense. With a Europe-wide rearmament, the American military presence in defense of Europe may be obsolete within a decade. Many Americans will initially be happy about this, but it also means that America will lose geostrategic influence in Europe. Britain, which post-Brexit wanted to step away from Europe, is now being bound back into it through the security politics of Europe. Sweden, Finland, Austria and Ireland are openly questioning their neutrality. The neoliberal idea that markets and economic codependency can further democracy and peace is now called into question. The fact that Switzerland is not being neutral in a conflict for the first time since 1814 is a big indicator of how substantial the impact of recent events are. 
Europe is for the first time ever united in a foreign policy and security policy commitment. And the result of that may be that Europe could emerge from all of this as a significant military and geopolitical power. Which would be somewhat ironic, since Putin's goal with his war was to end America's role as the sole superpower of the world and re-establish Russia as the world's second superpower. Instead, he may have created a different second power bloc, a rearmed Europe that may act as the world's second democratic geopolitical power. We are still very much in the heat of the moment. There are a lot of people cheering these recent developments. In particular, I have seen many people celebrate that Finland questioned its neutrality and considers NATO membership. And I would like to ask you all to instead take a moment to carefully reflect and consider. Consider what we could risk, consider what we may gain and consider what we may lose. Sweden, Ireland and Austria have all used their neutrality to play an invaluable role as peacekeepers and peace negotiators. Sweden played a big role in the South African peace agreements that ended apartheid and is currently one of the most important negotiators in the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. Ireland's peacekeepers have played an important role in places like the Congo. Austria has and is continuing to play an important role in the Iran nuclear negotiations as the seat of the International Atomic Energy Agency. If these countries end their neutrality, they will in all likelihood have to give that up too. Should Europe even desire to be a geopolitical power? And if it becomes such, should it seek out spheres of influence outside of Europe? The French have argued for that, while the Germans have always opposed it. The Americans may initially be glad to see a democratic Europe with a unified security policy in defense of European democracy, but those attitudes may change as soon as Europe makes a decision that the Americans disagree with. Remember that our refusal to join the war in Iraq only happened 20 years ago. Consider that a foundation of European politics and peace is economic codependency. A reason we completely opened our markets to each other is a belief that if our economies became interconnected enough, it will make war too costly to fight. Well, that is exactly what Germany tried to do with its gas and oil deals in Russia. It has spectacularly backfired. Does this now mean that economic codependency of nations is no longer a valid pathway to peace? Do we need to reevaluate this policy? Should we limit access to our markets only to democracies? An additional reason why Germany built a dependency on Russian gas and oil is the Iraq war. As a result of that war, Germany wanted European energy needs to be separated from the Middle East as much as possible to ensure Europe would never be dragged into a Middle Eastern war over energy as leverage. That policy has now produced the exact conflict that Germany wanted to avoid. The point I'm trying to make here is, is that the war in Ukraine has shattered the European security architecture and it has also shattered a considerable amount of what we thought of to be political certainties. But the war in Ukraine will also end one day and when it ends we will need a new security architecture for Europe. We need to discuss calmly, dispassionately and rationally what it should be because it is not just meant to serve us during war, but predominantly meant to ensure peace. We are going to need a new Kekkonen and a new spirit of Helsinki, a new foundation upon which to build and guarantee lasting peace in Europe. 